Since the writing of that joint document where they discuss the common communion, from conflict to communion, there have been new developments. And uh, I think we should discuss some of these as well, just to complete the picture. But I also want to tell you where I come from. And I don't want you all to get up and run away when I tell you where I come from. And I hope that you will bear with me. So I put it in writing so that nobody can say I'm hiding anything. It says there, I am a SDA. I am a Seventh-day Adventist. And this people is considered a sect by most mainline Christians today. So I'm a bit weird. We are considered legalists because we propagate the law, including the Seventh-day Sabbath. And as I said, I ask you to bear with me because this issue is quite a serious one. Now, if I'd had a choice, having been raised Catholic and my mother being Lutheran, I would probably like to be a Lutheran. And I'm probably more of a Lutheran than the Lutherans. But maybe I'm a little bit more of a Methodist than the Methodists. And I could go through all the denominations and say I have so much in common with all of them. But being an SDA, we still stick out like a sore thumb. So the Protestant world is planning officially to bury the hatchet in 2017, as we've discussed, on the 500th jubilee of their inception. And on some dates thereafter, for example, the Swiss Evangelical Reformed Church plans to officially bury the Reformation conflict in Wildhaus, the birthplace of Zwingli on Pentecost 2018. Phew, we still have some time, right? <laughs> According to the 316th edition of their Kirchenbote, which is their church herald, and that same issue, the church debates the meaning of truth in an ecumenical context. Now, I want to talk about this issue of Seventh-day Adventism and whether we are really so sectarian and non-Protestant and so legalistic as people consider. Well, here's a copy of that Kirchenbote. And one of the questions there is, who knows what truth is? Wer weiß, was Wahrheit ist? That's quite a scary question. Who knows what the truth is? And then in their discussion, and these are the descendants of Zwingli, they discuss all the philosophies from Aristotle all the way through, and I, I was just wondering, uh, excuse me, why not ask the Bible what is truth? Why ask all these other individuals what is truth? And then they have the page where they say, we are celebrating 500 years of the Reformation and we are going to put a full stop at our celebrations when we come together, Pentecost 2018, and we are going to bury that hatchet with Rome. Isn't it fascinating that they have specific dates when they plan these things? How can you ask the question, what is truth? When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. How can you ask the question, what is truth? When the Bible says, thy word is truth. How can you ask the question, what is truth? When the Bible says, thy law is truth. All thy commandments are truth. So Christ, his word, his system of government, that's the truth, according to the scripture. Pope to Lutherans, let us set doctrine aside. Let's help those in need. We've looked at that before. And so they came together, the Catholics and the Lutherans, and he urged them in Sweden, let's bury this hatchet. Let's set aside the doctrine, and we've looked at many of these doctrines. Doctrine is not important. Unity is important. We need to have a common voice. And the Pope likes to have the argument that if a terrorist is going to shoot you, 
He's not going to ask whether you are a Catholic or a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a, or a whatever. He's just going to ask, are you a Christian? And that's why we're all unified. Well, I'm not so sure. Let's ask the Bible what it thinks about doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Or Romans 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Or what about... Titus 2, 1, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Or 1 Timothy 4, 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So who should I listen to? Who should I obey now? The Pope who says, set aside doctrine? Or to the Bible that says, take heed of the doctrine. I can't, I can't obey both. I have to choose one. 1 John 1, 8, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. What do we do? One or the other? It's a serious issue. Pope Francis in Sweden urges Catholic Lutheran reconciliation. 500 years after Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the church door, setting off more than a century of religious warfare, he says, let's get together. Atonement and Christian reconciliation. And then the Catholics and the Lutherans sign a joint declaration accepting the common path. Well, this is fascinating. The BBC also had something to say, because there are Protestants in England as well, the Church of England and the Anglican Church and all their pomp and ceremony as well. A statement from the Archbishop of Canterbury and York has said that the split caused lasting damage to the unity of the church, something that contradicted the teaching of Jesus and left a legacy of mistrust and competition. And I look back on that his history the mind just boggles. And you look at the Oxford movement, which was led by that great man, Newman, with his booming voice and his demanding presence. And everything that was Protestant was removed out of the churches and everything that was Catholic was brought back. The altars were brought back. The statues were brought back. The images were brought back, the pictures were brought back, the mass was brought back, and the Protestant church moved into this Catholic era. And when the job had been done, he stepped over and he became a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church, left the Protestants and went to where he felt most comfortable. And for the work that he had done, he was canonized, and Pope Benedict went there just before his retirement and he and the Archbishop of Canterbury knelt down and prayed at these sites and they dug up the body of Cardinal Newman to get hold of his hands and the bones of his, of his hands to send them to the various churches to be venerated. And I just think to myself, oh, Protestantism, what are you doing? And this is what he said, legacy of mistrust and competition. I went on to say such repentance needs to be linked to action aimed at reaching out to other churches and strengthening relationships with them. And today's statement is a call to all Christians of whatever denomination to repent of division and to unite with the Christian gospel. So this is a, 
This is a worldwide movement. It doesn't affect only the Lutherans or the one denomination or the other. This is a massive movement. Unity, call on Reformation anniversary. And again, it is the 50th anniversary of a summit when Pope Paul and Archbishop Michael Ramsey, uh, which established the center in Rome, in a joint declaration issued after the service in October, the two leaders said they were undeterred from seeking unity between the two denominations. There is this drive. And if you're not part of this drive, well, then you are marginalized. You must be an antagonist. You must be full of hate. It's got nothing to do with hate. Maybe not to agree has more to do with love than it has to do with hate. Evangelical Lutherans overwhelmingly vote to approve the Declaration of Unity with the Roman Catholics in August 22, 2016, in this massive celebration. And the newspapers of the world just bring this news to the world. Christian news, Evangelical Lutherans overwhelmingly vote. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America voted overwhelmingly last week to approve a declaration of unity with the Roman Catholic Church in an endeavor to enumerate the many points of agreement between Lutherans and Catholics. Now, we've looked at some of those in the previous lecture, but here's a whole list of more agreements. And so I thought, well, we better look at those as well to see what all these agreements are about and to a move that some state is contrary to biblical Christianity. Well, the Declaration on the Way, that's the name of the document. Last time we looked from conflict to communion. Now we're looking at a new document, which is called Declaration on the Way, was approved by a vote of 931 to 9 during the assembly. That is scary. Nine stood up and said, no. Nine. That's very scary. The Declaration seeks to make more visible the unity we share by gathering together agreements reached on issues of church, Eucharist, and ministry. The document outlines, however, it is called on the way because the dialogue has not yet resolved all the church dividing differences on these topics. <laughs> it's amazing. And Bishop Elizabeth Eaton had this to comment on the signing of this joint declaration on the way. Dear sisters and brothers, let us pause to honor this historic moment, Eaton said. Though we have not yet arrived, we have claimed that we are in fact on the way to unity after 500 years of division and 50 years of dialogue. All those jubilees there again. This action must be understood in the context of other significant agreements we have reached, most notably the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification in 1999. And that is why I thought it important that I spend a whole lecture on this Joint Declaration, which was the first lecture in the series. I also wonder what happened to dear brothers and sisters, but we're moving with the times. I'm in big trouble now. Now, here's one who says, there's something wrong here. I don't know whether he's one of the nine. He could be. Mike Gendron, a former Roman Catholic who now leads Proclaiming the Gospel Ministry, an organization dedicated to evangelizing Catholics, said that uh, this council was in error in seeking to find common ground with Roman Catholicism, despite these doctrinal, doctrinal disparities. He says, by seeking unity with the Catholic religion, they are departing from the biblical faith of the reformers. He told Christian News Network, they need to know that there can never be biblical unity between Roman Catholics and denominations which uphold the gospel of God. He noted several other integral and fundamental differences between evangelicals and Roman Catholics. Number one, he says, the Bible teaches justification by faith. Catholicism condemns with anathema those who believe justification is by faith alone. 
And then he says, the Bible teaches we are born again by the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. And Catholicism teaches regeneration is by the water of baptism. The Bible teaches we are purified of sin by the blood of Jesus. Catholicism teaches purification by the fires of purgatory. He continued, the Bible teaches that Jesus is the one mediator between God and man, and Catholicism offers many mediators, including Mary and its priests. And Gendron said that the unity simply for the sake of unity is contrary to the scriptures. So I'm not alone in what I'm saying, and I'm sure many of you have similar sentiments. But it's nice to know that there are a few that say this is not the way to go. And when you claim, as I have done also in the previous lectures, that the Council of Trent made these decisions and therefore the Council of Trent is nominative and stands to this day, then many of the evangelicals that I talk to and say, ah, that was almost 500 years ago. Everything has changed since then. I mean the Council of Trent, who cares what they said? It's important what we're saying now. Well, does Rome see it like that? Let's ask them. This is Bishop Schneider. And he was uh, being questioned about the fact that the Pope recently on an airplane said to reporters that he was perfectly happy that Martin, that the Pope actually said to the reporters that he was perfectly happy with Martin Luther's position on justification. And uh, they asked Bishop Schneider at the Catholic conference, is this really so? And his answer was, I'll read it to you, we have already had an infallible response to the errors of Martin Luther, the Council of Trent. The teaching of the Council of Trent about the errors of Luther, I repeat, are infallible, ex cathedra, and the comments of the Pope on the plane are not ex cathedra. And in case someone thinks he really didn't say that, and it's just written here for interest's sake, let's listen to him say it. Now, he has a, has a heavy German accent, so that should be quite enjoyable to you. Your, ex Your Excellency, thank you for being here today. My question is, since the discussion is about heresy, one heretic who comes to mind is Martin Luther, whose 500th anniversary of the Reformation, uh, the Pope will be commemorating um, in the very, very shortly. Uh, on an airplane interview, the Pope recently said that Martin Luther quote, did not err on the issue of justification. Uh, what is your response to the Lutheran heresy and uh, on the issue of justification and the upcoming ecumenical events and how do traditional Catholics respond to uh, the reports that are coming out? They have already had an infallible response to the errors of Martin Luther, the Council of Trent. <laughs> the teaching of the Council of Trent about the errors of Luther, I repeat, are infallible ex cathedra. And the comments of the Pope in the plane are not ex cathedra. There you have it out of the horse's mouth. So the teachings of the Council of Trent are ex cathedra, infallible, the comments of the Pope. Doesn't matter what he says. It's interesting that they could say something like that, but if you understand Jesuit thinking, and the Pope is a Jesuit, then if they tell an untruth, let me put it mildly, and it furthers the aims of the church, then that is acceptable. But he won't do it from his bishop's seat, because then it is ex cathedra. I stand with Luther. Martin Luther said, this one and firm rock which we call the doctrine of justification is the chief article of the whole Christian doctrine which comprehends the understanding of all godliness. And Lutherans follow him in this and so do I. Now they say, 
that I, as a Seventh-day Adventist, am probably a legalist because I say we should keep the law and that we do not accept the doctrine of justification. So let me quote from one of our most authoritative sources as to what we actually believe. Here's a book called Faith and Works. It's an Adventist document. It says, let the subject be made distinct and plain that it is not possible to effect anything in our standing before God or in the gift of God to us through creature merit. Should faith and works purchase the gift of salvation for anyone, then the creator is under obligation to the creature. Here is an opportunity for falsehood to be accepted as truth. If any man can merit salvation by anything he may do, then he is in the same position as the Catholic to do penance for his sins. Salvation then is partly of debt that it may be earned as wages. So my dear Protestant brethren, I do not believe in salvation by works. I believe in salvation by faith. And the works are a consequence of that faith, not a means to that faith. Amen. And that's exactly what Martin Luther and all the reformers believe. In other words, I stand upon the pillars of Protestantism. Justification is by faith alone. And you will remember in this verse that Martin Luther, when he studied it, was overwhelmed by what he had discovered. In this excerpt from Luther and the Reformation, Sproul describes the moment of awakening Martin Luther had as he read Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And Martin Luther was crawling up that La Santa Scala, that holy stairway that miraculously had been transported by angels overnight from Jerusalem and plonked down in Rome. And if you crawl up it, you get indulgences and absolutions. And while he was halfway up, this verse thundered in his mind, the just shall live by faith. And then this article continues, and this uh, author writes, now there was a linguistic trick that was going on here too, and it was this, that the Latin word for justification that was used at this time in church history was, and it's the word from which we get the English word justification, the Latin word is justificare. And it came from the Roman judicial system, and the term justificare is made up of the word justice, which is, or justus, which is justice or righteousness, and the verb, the infinite facare, which means to make. And so the Latin fathers understood the doctrine of justification is what happens when God, through the sacraments of the church and elsewhere, make righteous people righteous. But Luther was looking now at the Greek word, which was in the New Testament, not the Latin word. The word is dikaios, dikaiosune, which didn't mean to make righteous, but rather to regard as righteous to count as righteous, to declare as righteous. And this was the moment of awakening for Luther. He said, you mean here Paul is not talking about the righteousness by which God himself is righteous, but a righteousness that God gives freely by his grace to people who don't have righteousness of their own? And so Luther said, whoa, you mean the righteousness by which I will be saved is not mine? It's what he called justitia alienum, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that belongs properly to somebody else. It's a righteousness that is extra nos, outside of us, namely the righteousness of Christ. And Luther said, when I discovered that, I was born again of the Holy Ghost and the doors of paradise swung open and I walked through. Amen. And... These are the things that we should remember in the time that we are going towards. 
because these will fortify us. Now, this is the journal America. This is the Jesuit journal in the United States. And the Jesuits, of course, are overwhelmed that the Protestants are streaming towards Rome. And so they claim uh, that this is giving them great joy. And they quote what Bishop Eaton said when she made that quote that we are joining together, though we have not yet arrived. Uh, we have claimed that we are, in fact, on the way to unity. And Bishop Madden told America, that's the, not the nation, but the magazine, the Jesuit magazine, that he encountered Lutherans expressing a real longing for unity, for coming together during the meeting, and that while hurdles remain, ratifying the document is an indication how much we are, along, are all longing for the day when we can receive the Eucharist together. John Rogers was prepared to die rather than to acknowledge that. By taking the Eucharist, what am I saying? That Christ is being sacrificed anew for me. Then I don't grab hold of that great sacrifice that was done for me at Calvary, which set me free and anyone else that grabs it by faith. I cannot partake of the Mass. I was Catholic. The Mass was your life because that is what gave you life. But to me, that life has become death because I found a greater life, one that is real and is embodied in the Son of God. He says, this document, the Declaration on the Way, was unveiled last year, and it compiles findings from 50 years of interfaith dialogue between two churches. In 32 statements of agreement on one's contentious theological issues. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them because, again, that would take forever and I'm already known for being incredibly long-winded. Not that you've noticed. <laughs> Preface. Here's the document. This is what it looks like. And I find it interesting that they use this, this picture because this is Jesus on the way to Emmaus with two disciples. But it is used here in the context of Protestantism and Catholicism coming together. It just doesn't taste right. Nevertheless, the document in the preface is the Declaration on the Word, Church, Ministry, and Eucharist, is a declaration of the consensus achieved by Lutherans and Catholics on the topic of the church, ministry, and Eucharist as a result of ecumenical dialogue between the two since 1965. Introduction. I think, then, that the one goal of all who are really and truly serving the Lord ought to be to bring back to union the churches which have at different times and in diverse manners divided from one another. Quoting St. Basil the Great. And the question they ask there in the document, why now? Because in 2017, we will commemorate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation movement that began in deep division and now calls us to continued work of reconciliation for the sake of the gospel and our witness and work in the world. So whenever I have the little picture of the document over there, I'm quoting directly from the document. Agreement on the church. Thus Lutherans and Catholics recognize in both their ecclesial communities the attribute of apostolicity. Interesting. Grounded in their ongoing continuity in apostolic faith, teaching, and practices. Hmm. Apostolicity. I thought this is something that uh, Luther denied. Because apostolicity claims that the power comes from the apostolic succession from Peter down the line to the present day Peter who happens to be the Pope. So they agree on the attribute of apostolicity. What else do they agree on? Preservation of the church in union with the saints. Catholics and Lutherans agree that the church on earth is indefectible. 
Did you get that? Because it is and will be preserved by the Holy Spirit and in all its aspects essential for salvation, they share the certainty of Christian hope that the church established by Christ and led by His Spirit will always remain in the truth, fulfilling its mission to humanity for the sake of the gospel. Hmm. Let's have a look at that word. This is merriamwebster.com, the dictionary. Definition of indefectible, not subject to failure or decay, free of fault, flawless. That's infallible. Acts 20 verse 30, also of our own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Or 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. My Bible warns me that there will be defectibility and I must beware of it. Here's a Catholic webpage that has interesting things to say. You can see it as a Catholic webpage. And they quote Luther quite correctly, but then they tear him apart. Luther's straw man, papal infallibility equals personal impeccability. You see, Martin Luther says, you know, when the Pope claims that he's infallible, who's he? How can any man claim to be such? He must be a very holy man, but when I look at him, he doesn't look holy at all because of all the excesses that were practiced in his days that disgusted him. But Rome says, you know, the man is, is off the wall. The Pope doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, he can be the worst person on earth. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that when he sits on that chair, he's infallible. No matter what the rest of his life is. But I thought the Bible says you must judge a man by his what? By his fruits. So let's see how they quote Martin Luther. They quote Martin Luther as having said, the hypocritical papists, being well aware that their false claim for supremacy of the Pope cannot stand unless backed by his personal holiness, proceed to bolster up that falsehood by a greater one. They endeavor to give him the reputation of personal goodness by saying he cannot err, for the Holy Spirit never forsakes him and Christ is ever with and in him. So modern Luther bashed the papacy on infallibility. And they continue then, why do they tell such blasphemous falsehoods? Doubtless because they are aware of the futility of attempting to maintain supremacy without personal goodness. They would be compelled to admit that exaltation without piety must be of the devil. It doesn't matter whether the Pope is good or bad. All that matters is that he is faultless when he speaks ex cathedra as the bishop just now said. So this is not some middle-aged doctrine. But the Lutherans and the Catholics agreed the church is infallible. The common statement of the U.S. dialogue around six, teaching authority and infallibility in the church asserts, quote, Lutheran and Catholic traditions share the certainty of Christian hope that the church established by Christ Remember, apostolicity, which church is that then? Rome. And led by his spirit will remain in the truth, fulfilling its mission to humanity for the sake of the gospel. That is a complete capitulation of Protestantism on this principle. They stood so firm. How can this happen? Agreement on ordained ministry. Ministry in the church. Lutherans and Catholics agree that the ordained ministry belongs to the essential elements that express the church's apostolic character. In other words, you can only get your power from the top down. You can only get it from the Pope. I cannot believe that they would sign something like this. It also contributes through the power of the Holy Spirit to the church's continuing apostolic faithfulness. The church is not wrong. 
The church cannot err. Therefore, their article on authority and ministry, Catholics and Lutherans also agree that the office of ministry stands over against gegen über, the community as well as within it, and thus is called to exercise authority over the community. We're back in the Middle Ages. The church will tell you with authority what to believe. And if you didn't do what the church said, then you ended up with the Inquisition. And I'm wondering whether the laws that have been enacted after all these terrible terrorist attacks in the worlds of late make this kind of attitude not only possible, but probable. All right, so now we have a new boss in town. On the Eucharist, well, we've discussed it, but this document also says Jesus Christ himself is present. He is present truly substantially as a person and he's present in his entirety as the Son of God and a human being. Good grief. Can you spell it out any more than that? It seems as if this document has taken the previous document to a new level. And has just put it so blatantly in Catholic terms, it's so in the face of Protestants, as if God is permitting it to say to Protestants, will you please open your eyes? Will you read these documents? Have you heard sermons on these documents? Who's preaching about these things? Why not? Protestants should be shouting it from the rooftop. Silent like church mice. The church is as well the temple of the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier. It's very carefully written in this form, who's the sanctifier? The church is the sanctifier. This is very scary. The international document, the apostolicity of the church, states that Catholics and Lutherans are one in confessing that the church is an essential work of the Holy Spirit who created the church through the gospel of Jesus Christ, drawing on the writings of Luther on the means of grace and marks of the church and on Vatican II regarding tradition, the church, and ecumenism. Lutherans and Catholics today mutually recognize at the fundamental level the presence of apostolicity in our tradition. Capitulated. Well, this is the magazine Christianity Today. It used to be Billy Graham's magazine. And let's see what they said about this issue, because this is interesting. They quote Martin Luther now, and we'll see what Martin Luther really said. Meanwhile, he was ordered to take his doctorate in the Bible and become a professor at Wittenberg University. During lectures on Psalms, in 1513 and 1514, this is before the Reformation, and a study of the book of Romans, he began to see a way through his dilemma. At last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand, the quoting Martin Luther, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the gates at, that had been flung open. On the heels of this new understanding came others. To Luther, the church was no longer the institution defined by apostolic succession. Isn't that interesting? Instead, it was the community of those who had been given faith. Salvation came not by the sacraments as such, but by faith. So here is a Christian magazine that tells you what Martin Luther's position was. And my question is, has that position in this new document been reversed? Yes or no? Yes. So who capitulated? Again. It is Protestantism. With great clearness and power, the apostle presented the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ. This is an Adventist source. Just to show you what Adventists believe, because 
constantly the statement is, you're not Protestants because you don't believe like Protestants. Well, can't do better than this. With great clearness and power, the apostle presented the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ. He hoped that other churches also might be helped by the instruction sent to the Christians at Rome. But how dimly could he foresee the far-reaching influence of his words? Through all the ages, the great truth of justification by faith has stood as a mighty beacon to guide repentant sinners into the way of life. It was this light that scattered the darkness which enveloped Luther's mind and revealed to him the power of the blood of Christ to cleanse from sin. The same light has guided thousands of sin-burdened souls to the true source of pardon and peace. For the epistle to the Church of Rome, every Christian has reason to thank God. So my appeal to the Protestant brethren is just for a while put aside your bias and ask yourself, are these people really not Protestants? Or has Protestantism become less Protestant than it should be? Is that a fair question? Eschatological dimensions of the Eucharist. Catholics and Lutherans agree that Eucharistic communion as sacramental participation in the glorified body and blood of Christ is a pledge that our life in Christ will be eternal. I uh, feel such pain. This is what Rome teaches. By just partaking of the host, you are guaranteed eternal life. That's not biblical. What is biblical is to give your life to Christ and to say, Lord, I am a sinner, forgive me. And he imputes his righteousness to you and you stand before him in the righteousness of Christ himself. And that mercy seat protects you from the curse of the law and you have life. This is salvation by works. The Eucharist and the Church, Lutherans and Catholics, agree that the sharing in the celebration of the Eucharist is an essential sign of the unity of the Church. So they want to come together and have joint celebration. The one believing it's a symbol, the other one believing it's a sacrifice. You can't do both. Lutherans and Catholics agree that in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ himself is present truly, substantially, as a person. He's present in his entirety as the Son of God and a human being. Whew. While the sacrifice is the church's sacrifice of praise, praise, our response to God's gift, the response includes, in the wider sense, all good deeds that spring from faith. You're back to salvation by works. In its entirety, it is scary Luther contributed to this insight when he insisted that a manifold Christian substance must be recognized in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I want you to read this carefully, as the Germans would say, mit Verstand, with your mind. What does it say? Luther recognized in the Roman Catholic Church for he perceived there the true Holy Scriptures, true baptism, true sacraments of the altar, true keys for forgiveness of sins, the true office of proclamation, and the true catechism. Did you get that? Luther saw all those things in the Roman Catholic Church. How can you write something like this in this document when it is a blatant falsification of the facts of history? How can you do that and think you can get away with it? The proclaimed gospel has a primacy amongst the mediations of communion in Christ and his benefits, but receiving it in faith entails as well receiving the sacramental practices of baptism 
the Lord's Supper or Eucharist and absolution from sin, all as administered by those called to the ministry of the word and the sacrament. We're back to priests. It's a complete Roman Catholic theology. Nothing to do with Reformed theology. Martin Luther, did you please tell me, did you at any time after the Reformation, when you were no longer in the Catholic Church, did you agree that the true Holy Scriptures, the true baptism, the true sacrament of the altar, the true keys of forgiveness of sins, the true offers of proclamation, and the true catechism was to be found in the Catholic Church? Did you? Well, let's ask Martin Luther. This is their Bible, Revelation chapter 17, the kings of the world bowing down to a woman riding a political beast, and she has a triple crown, which is the papal crown, on her head. And Martin Luther writes, nothing else than the kingdom of Babylon and of very Antichrist. For who is the man of sin and the son of perdition? But who, he who by his teaching and his ordinances increases the sin and perdition of souls in the church, while he yet sits in the church as if he were God. All these conditions have now for many ages been fulfilled by the papal tyranny. Did he believe that the tru truth was in Rome? No. How can they put it in that document? I, I cannot understand it. Unless there is a, an agenda. And how can that bishop stand up and say, sisters and brothers, we've reached consensus. And this is the consensus she's talking about. History of the Reformation, Abinier's great book. What a marvelous book on the history of Reformation. They write, Luther proved by the revelation of Daniel and St. John, by the epistles of St. Paul and Peter and Jude, that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy, and all the people did say, Amen. A holy terror seized their souls. It was Antichrist whom they beheld seated on the pontifical throne. This new idea, which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther in the midst of his contemporaries, inflicted the most terrible blow on Rome. And this press that you see over there, the original one, pumped out these pictures one after the other, informing the populace as to what the opinion of the reformers was. And you cannot destroy history unless you can, of course, tell the history in a different way. And to make sure, they hewed it in stone and placed it on their Rathaus in Nuremberg, which was one of the principal seats of the Reformation, just to make sure nobody misunderstood. They hewed the interpretation of Daniel chapter 7 and the little horn power which they defined as Rome onto the walls. Now, I want to take you to the Redeemer Lutheran Church webpage where they have an article called The Reformer's Interpretation of the Antichrist. Now, this is not an Adventist source. This is a Lutheran source. And I'm so grateful that there are still Lutherans who believe what Luther said. And this is what they said. As early as the 12th century, the Valdensians, dissidents, outside the church, identified the little horn and the man of sin as the Roman papacy. But even within the church, amongst the most learned godly men, papacy also became increasingly identified as Antichrist and the man of sin. And then they give a history. Now, I'm not going to read it all. We'll sit here all day, but I'll fly through it. They say, all right, let's have a look at the pre-Reformation interpretation as to who the Antichrist was. And they take it back to 1300 and something, and they mention Dante and uh, all these fancy names, Johannes Militzinth and John Wycliffe, of course, and all of these. And then they're talking about who's the harlot in Revelation 17, and who is the abomination of desolation and the Antichrist, etc.? And who is the beast of Revelation 13 and the harlot 
of Revelation 17 and who is Babylon. How did these people see it? Pre-Reformation. And you can see it there. Rome, Rome, Pope, Pope, Rome, Rome, papacy, 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 hierarchy, fallen church, papacy, papacy, Pope, Pope, Pope. That's how they saw it. Pre-Reformation. All right, some more. Pervy, Brood, Jan Hus, 100 years before Luther. How did they see Romans, uh, Revelation 13 and 666 and the harlot of Revelation 17? Who did they think it was? Pope, papacy, hierarchy, Pope, papacy, 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 Bishop of Rome, Rome, papacy, 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 There you go. That's how they saw it. All right, Reformation era interpretation. How did the reformers see this issue? And who was the Antichrist? Who was the little horn? Who was the man of sin? Who was uh, the beast of Revelation 13? Who was the harlot of Revelation 17? And all of those questions all the way through. Martin Luther, Melanchthon, and all of Van Amstorf, by the way, he compiled that great book, Table Talk. How did they see it? Look at that. Papacy, 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 papacy. Not one dissenting voice there. This was the Reformed position. And they go through them all, George Nicodemus, etc., etc., and you can look at the list there. Sometimes they add the Pope to the Turk, but the Turk is always second, then it's papacy, 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 all the way down. Bullinger, Tyndall, it doesn't matter who you mention, look at that, it is so consistent, there is just no getting around it. John Bale, Jewell, papacy, all the way down, whether you're talking of Revelation 13, 17, whatever. Papacy. And then post-Reformation, James I of England, who was the Antichrist, who was the little horn, who was Revelation 13's beast, papacy, papacy, papacy. Dowham and all these people. And uh, you had Daniel Kramer and Mead, and the same you find all the way down the list. And uh, I mean, the list is just endless. It's always papacy. That's how they interpreted it, all these famous people. And uh, who else do we have here? Daniel Whitty, Weston, all of them interpret them as papacy. There's not one dissenting voice. So Isaac Newton, I mean, he was not too dumb, was he? He said it was the papacy. He was a bit confused on Revelation 13, but in other words, he was bang on target. Thomas Pyle, all of these people. Thomas Newton, John Gill, John Wesley, papacy, 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 papacy. I mean, we can go down the list, and it stays that way. And then they give a superb Bible study. These are the Lutherans, not those that signed. Why did the protests change? In view of the foregoing Reformation interpretations identifying papacy as the Antichrist and man of sin, why do so many evangelical Protestants today believe the man of sin and antichrist are future individuals. This is a Protestant Lutheran webpage. The Reformation break from the papacy. The man of sin had been revealed, recognized, proclaimed as the papacy by the Reformers. Not only the Reformers, but thousands of their followers and their kings agreed with this prophetic interpretation. Papal reaction, counter-Reformation in an attempt to divert the undermining influence of the Protestant Reformation, a two-pronged counter-attack was made. Around 1590, Francisco Ribera published a 500-page book on the Revelation. The first chapters of Revelation he applied to the time of an early church. From Revelation chapter 4 onward, he applied literally to a literal three-and-a-half-year reign of an individual man, Antichrist. He taught that Antichrist would rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, deny Christ, pretend to be God, and conquer the world. And so there was a preterist school founded by Alcaza, a Jesuit, in 1640 to counter this interpretation of the Protestants. And there was a futuristic school founded by Francisco Ribera and Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, both of them Jesuits. And the first one taught that Revelation was fulfilled uh, in the time of uh, the Greeks, 
And we read the fulfillment of the revelation in the past with the fall of Jerusalem or the fall of pagan Rome before the popes ever ruled Rome. And mainly they talk about Antiochus Epiphanes IV, a Greek king. But Daniel clearly says he comes out of the fourth kingdom, which is Rome. So it cannot be. And then the other one, that this is this future Antichrist that will come sometime. Robert Bellarmine, one of the most renowned Jesuit cardinals, taught that the Antichrist would be an individual Jew who would reign a little three and a half years in Jerusalem in whom would dwell all the power of the devil, paving the way for papal Protestant union. The evangelical fundamentalist interpretation of Antichrist and man of sin as follows Ribera and Bellarmine's futuristic viewpoints. Not only has the futurist interpretation negated the powerful Reformation interpretation against papacy, but it also allows room for ecumenism between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. If the papacy is not Antichrist, then there is no point to the Reformation's separation from the papacy. Right, that was a Protestant interpretation, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and this is exactly what I would tell people as well. So, does that make me now not a Protestant? If there are Protestants that believe exactly what the Protestants believed, and some still believe today, so does that make me a sect if I believe it? Cannot be. Yeah, they continue. Catholics and Lutherans agree that the church on earth is united with the community of the saints in glory. Now it gets interesting. All right. What do they mean? Communio between Christ's saints on earth and Christ's saints who have already died. We believe in the fundamental indestructibility of life given us in Christ. This is their common statement. The communion in Christ into which human beings are called endures also in death and judgment. It becomes complete as through the pain of a failure in early life, persons come with their love to give the perfect response to God. Okay, so there are people there and people here, and they are in communion with each other. It goes further. It says here, the hope of eternal life asserts the fellowship of those sanctified, the holy ones or saints, includes believers both living and dead. There is thus a solidarity of the church throughout the world with the church triumphant. This solidarity across the barrier of death is particularly evident in the Eucharist, which is always celebrated in unity with the hosts of heaven. The apparent division marked by death melts away. Okay, so if you partake in the Mass... You are not celebrating it alone, but all the dead are celebrating it with you. This is a joint document between the Protestants and the Catholics. Now, I don't believe this, but I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, so I must be a sect. But uh, let's have a look at the history and see what it really means. This is what spiritism believes. Spiritualism has six basic fundamental principles from which proceed all their practices. One, the existence of God. It's interesting, they acknowledge God. And then the immortality of the soul. They believe in reincarnation, plurality of inhabited worlds, and communicability of the spirits. So this is what spiritism believes. And this is what this joint document has just affirmed together with Rome. Let's have a look at this doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. 1 Timothy 1.17, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. The king is immortal. 1 Timothy 6, 14 to 16, that thou keep the commandments without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who 
only has immortality. The Bible teaches that we are mortal. Rome teaches we are immortal. Who do I believe? The Bible? Or them? Dwelling in the light which no man can approach, unto whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. That's what the Bible teaches. Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of his sleep. Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he had spoken of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, He's dead. In Christ. You are asleep, you're like on a hard disk or on a flash drive. And God can bring you back to life like you can bring the, what's on a flash drive back to life on your computer. To you, to him you are asleep in the state of death. And the Bible says, till heaven be no more, they shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. So until the last day they sleep. For in death there is no remembrance of thee in the grave. Who shall give thee thanks, let alone who shall celebrate the Eucharist? <laughs> it says so plainly. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. So I agree with this. Rust in peace. <laughs> the Bible says exactly what happened? Genesis 3 verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. God said you will die. It's the serpent that said you will not die. Genesis 3 5, For God does know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So there are three doctrines here. You will not die, you will be as gods, and you will be able to distinguish what morality is. You will be able to distinguish between good and evil. There's only one church that has all three of those doctrines as dogmas. And that's wrong. And all the others have drunken of this wine of the wrath of a fornication. Let's ask the Catholic Church. What about death? Article 366 in the Catholic Catechism, the church teaches that every spiritual soul is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death. That's the church teaching it. Does Rome know what the Bible teaches? This is the New Catholic Encyclopedia. The soul in the Old Testament means not a part of man, but the whole man as a living being. Similarly, in the New Testament, it signifies human life, the life of an individual conscious object. Recent exegetes have maintained that the New Testament does not teach immortality of the soul in the Hellenistic sense of survival of an immortal principle after death. So Rome says, we say you're immortal. The Bible says you're not. We don't care. We tell you you're immortal. That's what they say. That's arrogance of the highest order. Pope Leo X had the following to say when he issued his bull against Martin Luther in 1513. We do condemn and reprobate all who assert that the intelligent soul is mortal. So if you believe that you do not have immortality, you're condemned by Rome. Martin Luther answered the Pope most gloriously when he said, when he answered and cited the Pope's immortality declaration as amongst those monstrous opinions to be found on the Roman dunghill of decretals. <laughs> Martin Luther had a way with words. I think it wouldn't go down well today. Now, here's an article from Archbishop Francis Blackburn, and he states the following. Luther espoused the doctrine of the sleep of the soul upon a scripture foundation and then made use of it as a confutation of purgatory, saint worship, and continued in that belief to the last moment of his life. 
Now, here's a man, Martin Luther, who translated the Bible and must have mulled over every single word, how do I explain this and how do I translate this and what does this mean? He must have. And Tyndall must have done the same when he translated the English Bible, the Bible into English. So this is what Martin Luther said. We should learn to view our death in the right light so that we need not become alarmed on account of, of it, as unbelief does. Because in Christ it is indeed not death, but a fine, sweet, and brief sleep, which brings us relief from this veil of tears, from sin and from the fear and extremity of real death, and from the misfortunes of this life, and we shall be secure and without care, rest sweetly and gently for a brief moment as on a sofa, until the time when she shall awaken us together with all his dear children to his eternal glory and joy. For since we call it a sleep, we know that we shall not remain in it, but shall again be awakened and live, and that the time during which we sleep shall seem no longer than if we had just fallen asleep. Hence, we shall censure ourselves that we su were surprised or alarmed at such a sleep in the hour of death and suddenly come alive out of our grave from decomposition, entirely well, fresh, pure, clear, glorified life, meet our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in the clouds. Scripture everywhere affords such consolation, which speaks of the death of the saints, as if they fell asleep and were gathered to their fathers. That ease had overcome death through this faith and comfort in Christ and awaited the resurrection, together with the saints who preceded them in death. That's what Martin Luther wrote. Seventh-day Adventists believe what Martin Luther wrote. Amen. So here's my question. Am I now an infidel because I believe what Martin Luther wrote? Or do Christians today generally no longer believe what the Reformers believe? So who's changed? Am I now belonging to a sect because I believe what the Reformers believe? And I don't believe what the modern Reform churches believe, who now believe exactly what the Pope believes and put it in writing, and believe that they celebrate the Mass together with the dead people up there? Well, what about Tyndall? British noble translator came to the defense of the revived teaching of conditional immortality. So it was revived by the reformers. This, as well as other teachings, brought him in direct conflict with the papal champion Thomas More, who strongly objected against Tyndall and Luther, who, in the words of More, said, All souls lie and sleep till doomsday. In 1530, Tyndall responded vigorously, saying, and he's arguing now with Thomas More, and he's a little bit sarcastic. And ye, talking to Thomas More, in putting them, the departed souls, in heaven, hell, and purgatory, destroy the arguments whereby Christ and Paul prove the resurrection. And again, if the souls be in heaven, tell me why do they not be in as good case as the angels be? And then what cause is there of the resurrection? So this is the father of the Church of England that gave them the Bible in the English tongue. This is the basis of the Geneva Bible that formed the Protestant Bible for the first years. And they don't believe it. And if I believe it, I belong to a sect and they no longer belong to a sect now? How does that work? Tyndall pressed his contention even further, showing that the papal teaching on the subject is in conflict with St. Paul. Then he says sarcastically, Nay, Paul, thou art unlearned. Go to Master Moore and learn a new way. We be not most miserable, though we rise not again, for our souls go to heaven as soon as we be dead and are there in as great joy as Christ that is risen again. And I marvel that Paul had not comforted the Thessalonians with that doctrine, if he had wished it, if he had known about it, that the souls of the dead should rise again. If the souls be in heaven, in as great glory as the angel after your doctrine, then show me what cause should there be of the resurrection? I mean, it is such a silly doctrine. There you go, yeet up to heaven, then down again, and it's very confusing. 
Revelation 16 verse 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. And the Bible tells you who the dragon is. It's the devil himself. And the mouth of the beast, and the reformers told us who the beast was, because all the attributes apply only to one system, and that is Rome. In fact, Spurgeon said, it fits like one of Chubb's keys, Chubb's locks, and refuses to fit any other. So we have spiritism, the voice of demons speaking through people. We have Catholicism. And then we have the sad mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God, God Almighty. The conflict between truth and error is coming to a head. And it seems as if Rome has mustered its forces, being supported by the dragon, and has drawn in Protestantism to teach the same doctrines that separated mankind from God in the first place. Vatican Protestants, not sister churches. Christianity today. The Vatican has dealt a blow to Catholic Protestant relations by reaffirming its doubts about the validity of Protestant churches and by officially ordering Catholic bishops not to use the term sister churches in reference to them. This was the previous Pope, Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was still the head of the Foundation for Doctrine and Faith. So they're not sisters. They're naughty children. They have to come back to mommy. And the Bible says she will not suffer loss of children. Cardinal note approved by Pope John Paul to be held as authoritative and binding according to Cardinal Ratzinger. Well, we don't have to go into details. Here's the document again. For Catholics, the Bishop of Rome, successor of Peter, has a unique responsibility as pastor and teacher to this universal church. So this is what the Catholics believe. Then they say down here, nevertheless, as the ministry in the church declared, the possibility begins to emerge that the Petrine office of the Bishop of Rome need not be excluded by Lutherans as a visible sign of the unity of the church as a whole. They've capitulated. We have no king but Caesar. This is a sad moment for Protestantism. This is uh, Richard M. Gula, Jesuit, theologian, and he's quoting the official text of the 1978 National Catechetical Directory, Sharing the Light of Faith and States. He states the following, It is the task of the catechesis to elicit assent to all that the Church teaches. For the church is the indispensable guide to the complete richness of what Jesus teaches. When faced with questions which pertain to dissent from non-infallible teachings of the church, it is important for the catechist to keep in mind that the presumption is always in favor of the magisterium. Okay, so what's the Jesuits say? Remember that the Jesuits were created to counter the Reformation and to destroy it. And their Jesuit oath says exactly that, that they will do anything to destroy Protestantism. And here this man says, with the full assent of his superior, who is now the Pope, that you have to comply with the teaching of the church, the magisterium. And then he puts it this way. Only a system of tight syllogism which leave no room for the personal affective element, they have such a way with words, would come near guaranteeing certitude about knowing and doing what God requires and enables. Let me put that in simple words. Shut your brain off, put it in the freezer, forget about it, and do what you are told. That's what it says. Now, why did God give us a brain and put 
the decision capacity right in the front and tell you to choose ye this day whom you will serve. If you're supposed to put your brain aside and listen to instruction. Knowing good and evil, very important. The magisterium has appealed to natural law as the basis for its teachings pertaining to a just society, sexual behavior, medical practice, human life, religious freedom, and the relationship between morality and civil law. In any case, the development of natural law tradition amongst Christian thinkers is due not so much to the scriptures as to the influence of Greek philosophy and Roman law. This is the serpent speaking. You will decide between good and evil, not God. This is dangerous. Unbelievable. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said through the call, you know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was, right? He was a Lutheran theologian, and Adolf Hitler had him arrested and murdered because he didn't agree with the system. Through the call of Jesus, men became individuals. Willy-nilly, they are compelled to decide, and that decision can only be made by themselves. It is no choice of their own that makes them individuals. It is Christ who makes them individuals by calling them. Every man is called separately and must follow alone. But men are frightened of solitude and they try to protect themselves by merging themselves in the society of their fellow men and their material environment. You have a God-given right to choose between truth and error. This comes from the great book, Desire of Ages. It's an Adventist book. It has been hailed as one of the greatest expositions on the life of Christ that has ever been written. Every great Protestant preacher had that book on his shelf and took hold of that book to preach the most powerful sermons that they ever preached. And yet they denounce the authors, who are Seventh-day Adventists, as infidels. Because they believe what the Reformers believed in the beginning. It says here, it's not by the decisions of courts or council or legislative assemblies not by the patronage of world's great men is the kingdom of Christ established, but by the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity through the work of the Holy Spirit. As many as received him, to them he gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Salvation comes outside of myself. I cannot decide what is right and wrong if I do not have the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Here is the only power that can work the uplifting of mankind and the human agency for the accomplishment of this work is the teaching and practicing of the Word of God. This is the heart and core of Protestantism. It has always been the heart and core. Why should it change now? Revelation 14, 7 says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. If you believe today that God made the heavens, the sea, and the springs of water, you are considered insane. When I was professor at the university, and I was professor of zoology, and the head of the zoology department, unheard of, a creationist head of a secular university's zoology department, they had a number of cases against me, and the one case categorically stated, you cannot be a scientist and believe in God at the same time. It was investigated, and because it was against the Constitution, it was thrown out. But nevertheless, it just shows the mindset of man in the world today. You can bring as much proof as you like, because I don't just believe this willy-nilly. I believe it on the basis of sound substance. You must study these things. We are not born without a mind. God doesn't expect us to be blind, 
Study the scriptures that you may be approved. So this is my appeal to Protestants. Don't just write us off. We're no better than you. We're not better people because we are Seventh-day Adventists. We're not better. In fact, we are probably a lot worse because God is gathering people from the highways and the byways and there are people with damages on the outside and more damages on the inside than we care to remember. But we believe in the Protestant principles and there are Protestants out there in the world that believe everything that we believe but you just don't find it all in one place. You find one group believing this bit, you find one group believing that bit, but if you put it all together, and we lead it back right to the Protestant Reformation, then we believe exactly what the Reformers believed. Exactly. And we have some more that we believe. But it's all based on the Scripture. And may God just take these scales from the eyes of the Protestants that they study their heritage, that they study the doctrines again, that they may understand what the plan of salvation is. Because your very life hinges on the plan of salvation. Because it is not they that do, but they that believe that are accredited with the righteousness of Christ. The doing is a consequence, not a means. May God bless you as you contemplate these things. I'm not indoctrinating you, I'm just giving information. And tomorrow we will end on a very, very important note, which will deal with all those final characteristics which make the end time message so important. We will talk about the issues of revelation and what the final mark of the one organization as opposed to the mark of God is going to be. May God bless you and thanks for listening. Hi YouTube, I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.